But I'm going to tell you, what you keep your finger with, because we're going to skip a little bit. Amen. I want to thank this group that was up here singing, your song director. Well, you know, a good job. If it was any better, I thought I'd done it. Amen. Good to have you all this morning. Thank you for the invitation. Seriously, I do appreciate being able to be the campus. Now, someone asked me, have I been here before? Yes, I have. The last time I was here, I think, in a service, Jim Bean was your pastor. That's been a while. I was only 10 years old. <laughs> Good to have you this morning. I want you to do something real quick before me. Turn to the person on the left and right of you and tell them you smell good. <laughs> Like I was, there were several of us in the family. 
and we all took the bath in the same tub, the same water. Oh, that was nice. <laughs> so when you got out, so when you got out, uh, I want to set this up here. You want to know how long I'm going to take a proper lunch? <laughs> I don't know these up here. If you think you're going to get hungry, you can have it. <laughs> but I want to share with you why I said all of that is to cause you to understand. People today are different. They will come to church, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> and they've got different ideas on this matter of, of uh, serving God <coughs> and being, being a Christian and how to look like a Christian and how to act like a Christian. What are you at, Marvin? Harris? I can see you looking at me somewhere. <laughs> yeah, fact, there he is. I don't have any eyes on me. Simplify, brother. Good to see you. But listen, the way they come to church today, in many churches, in many of our religions, and I'm, I'm talking Southern Baptist now, okay? I'm not going to get on the other denomination. But I've been a Southern Baptist for close to 50 years. And I've seen a lot of change. Now, today, many people come to church and they look good. They try to look as good as your spokesman, but they don't make it. I've already been in the movies. But they'll come in, men will come in in their suits and ties. Used to. And women would come in their beautiful dresses that were long enough and covered up enough. Used to. No, I'm not joking. I'm telling my friends. And they would they would put on their makeup and they would talk, talk folks it's like butter wouldn't melt in their mouth. You wait till you get home. You take that tie off, you take that suit off, you take that makeup off, and folks say a different person. The talk's not the same, the action's not the same. There's nothing changed on the any side. You have to be clean on the inside before you can think about cleaning up on the outside good enough to satisfy God. That's right. Now, if you want to know where I'm coming from, I told you to turn to Matthew chapter 12. I want you to hear what Jesus has to say about this smart smile, the smile we got in the smart dress and the beautiful makeup and everything. But I want you to look here in Matthew's talk. <coughs> Excuse me. In chapter 12, verse 2 and 3, and Jesus was speaking here. He said, There is nothing covered that shall not be revealed, nor hid that shall not be made known. Now there's some people here today that's got a problem. There's some people here today that's got sin in their life. And ladies and gentlemen, I will never, if God allows me, I will never close a service without giving God's invitation. It's not my invitation. It's not going to be church invitation. It's going to be God's invitation. Now you come, you can come for whatever reason. Maybe there's something wrong in your life. Maybe you know someone that's needing prayer. Maybe you're sitting here this morning and you've never really received Christ as your personal Savior. I'm going to tell you, if you're here in that condition, if God should come back right now, if Christ should come back right now, if you were to die of a heart attack right now, you would die and go to hell. Right. You've got to be saved. Amen. And we're going to look at that this morning, how God looks at you, and, and Jesus is saying here, you can come in in your nice suits and ties. Now you look at me, and I'm going to be serious about that. If you look at me, and I don't look just too bad, old and ugly, but I don't look too bad. But you don't know what's inside of you. God does. And I don't know what's inside of you, but God does. And you may be struggling with a problem. That you've been battling for a long time. And God has said, in just a few moments, you know, I want to talk to you. I want to help you. I want to bless you. Then you may be here and you have somebody in your family that doesn't know Christ as their personal Savior. You may be here and somebody is backslidden out of the church. And Lord, have mercy. Just go to some of the other church and you'll see a lot of backslidden. The last church I was in, I'll be honest with you, I started to go down here to... Pennies, 
on the mall. I have a lady friend that's a, been a manager there for a long time. And I'll tell you what I started to do, and I thought, well, I, I'd be a little smart at it. But I started to go down and get me about eight or ten mannequins. mannequins. And I was going to dress them up and set them in the pews. I would get the same results out of them as I get them out of the folks that really walk in. Listen, God wants you to get involved. Right. This is a beautiful church. Right. This is one of the finest congregations I've been in in a long time. I want to thank you because you made everybody feel welcome when they come in. I don't know how many people came by and shook my hands and welcomed me and said thank you for being my wife. A lot of churches don't do that. You come in and you sit down and God forbid you sit in the wrong seat. Because <laughs> the balance is up there seat small. You want to get in there. Because you get to <laughs> You got the few folks. So there's something wrong inside there. If they want that seat bad enough, tell you, tell them to get up and, and, and sit on their lap, you know. But folks, we need to check the inside of it. You want to know what's the matter with our children today that's going on in this world? How our children are getting into trouble? Our children are going to jail. Our children are killing one another and killing their parents. Ladies and gentlemen, it starts at home. It does not start in the school. It does not start in Bible school. It starts at home. When God blesses you with that beautiful bundle of joy, that's when you take charge. And you stay in charge. Right. If you wait till they get 12 or 14 years old, forget it. Amen. You're going to do what they say. But God says you need to inspect yourself on the inside. If there's something in there that's out of whack, during the invitation, you come, you talk to God. God will show you how to get it straightened out. And you walk out of these doors, you're a happier person than what you came in. And full of more knowledge, ladies and gentlemen. But the Lord said, what's going on inside you is not it. I see, God said. But look at verse 3. Therefore, whatsoever you have spoken in the darkness shall be heard in the light, and that which was spoken in the ear in the closet shall be proclaimed upon the housetop. You're going to, yes, ma'am? Matthew. Oh, I said, I'm sorry. I'm not in Matthew. Thank you. I'm glad I got my boss with me. <laughs> Boy, you thought I was out of the King James, didn't you? I'm glad y'all patient with me. Look at God. Look at God. Now we're going somewhere. Go with me to Luke's gospel this morning. Luke chapter 12, verse 2 and 3. I'll read the verse 2. I'm going to read verse 3 again. Therefore, whatsoever you have spoken in the darkness shall be heard in the light. And that which you have spoken in the ear and the closet shall be pro proclaimed from the housetop. There is nothing going to be hid if you haven't turned it over to God. Right. We're going to see something a little bit on that too. Just a moment. And I want you to get a picture of what Jesus is saying here. You might dress up and look beautiful or handsome on the outside, but He knows what's going on on the inside. Amen. And if you don't let him straighten it out, you will never get it straightened out. Right. Oh, how many times have I went to visit with people and said, well, when I get my life straightened out, I'll get to church. I said, you'll die, I'll go to hell. Right. Well, that's what you're waiting on. Right. Well, you don't need to talk to me like that. I'm just telling you what the Bible says. Right. I don't cut them any slack. Right. The Lord didn't cut us any slack. Right. People talk about, well, you shouldn't say hell. It's in the Bible more than hell it is. That's right. You need to hear about it. People are afraid to talk about him anymore. They're afraid to talk about sin anymore. They're afraid that they're going to lose their job. But, hey, God gave me this and how did he match it? Amen. I'm going to give you a little background real quickly. You want to know what I'm going to quit when I get done? Amen. Now you're looking at a young man. No. <laughs> now seriously, folks, you're looking at a man who, who lived a life that I ought to have been in prison by now. I'm sure, and I'm not making that up. I, I should be. I was ugly. I knew everything. I didn't take advice from anybody. And there was a reason behind that. I'm not going back there. It's because of what I had to experience from a little child on. And I was bitter. I didn't know how to handle it. Nobody told me about Jesus. Nobody told me about the church. Nobody told me that I could get relief. 
So when that school teacher, one morning I walked in and he made a smart remark about me. That one of them welfare kids. One of them kids that don't have a mom and daddy. And it made me mad. And I took the books and I threw them on the desk. He said, you pick those books up. I said, you want to pick them up? You pick them up. He said, you're going to be expelled. I said, you can't do that. He said, why not? I said, I quit. I walked out, folks. Smart. And listen, you young people, if you ever make that mistake, you already... That's right. You better think twice before you make that big mistake. That's right. That's right. But I was my own boss. I knew everything and I could handle everything. And I had something inside me that needed help and I didn't know where to get it. So I quit and I walked out and went down to Evansville. And I got me a job working for the government. Five years of saying, yes sir, yes sir, yes sir, yes sir. Marvin Powers knows what I'm talking about. Marine Corps boot camp will straighten you out in a minute. I come out of the Marine Corps and I didn't change a whole lot. The only thing the Marine Corps taught me how to do better than I knew when I went in was a drink. They taught me how to do that. Except in Japan and they didn't drink over there because they went up the wall. I come home and things didn't change. I went to work at a factory here in Edward in Newburgh. I'm trying to hurry this up, and I'm going to show you why. What I'll tell you what I'm telling you. I'll tell you what God can do if you'll turn your life over to Him. My wife kept asking me, Would you please go to church with me? Ladies and ladies, listen to me. Don't you give up on your husband if he's not going to church. Amen. My wife asked me every Sunday, The children and I are going to Sunday school and church, would you go? I'm too tired, babe. You know, I go there sometime. You know, uh, I've heard all that stuff before. I don't need to hear that. You take the kids and get them right. Man. I'll just stay home and keep the things together here. It went on for years. One Sunday, she asked me to go. And I thought, well, maybe I will. I'm going to hurry this real quick. I'm going to cut a whole lot of. I hope I get to come back. I'd like to tell y'all. But God called me. <coughs> I had quit school. <coughs> I had quit reading. I wouldn't read a book, I wouldn't read a paper, I wouldn't read anything until one day a man gave me a Louis Lamar Western book in Alabama. And I looked at it, ladies and gentlemen, here's, here's what happened after, after about 15 years of not reading a thing except what I had to read on the signs going up, I go to seminar. And when I started reading that Louis Lamar book, I will read the second verse again like I read it again. Jesus speaking, for, for, for there, there is, is, is no, nothing uh, covered. Ladies and gentlemen, I was, in, I was married and in my 20s, close to 30. Young people listen to me. You either use what God gives you or you're going to lose it. God will take it away from you. But I read one book after another and after another and after another and I was sitting in a Sunday school class one day and our pastor had left, many of you know him as Reverend Dick, Dick Roots. Our pastor had left. He, I helped him load his truck the day before. I'm going to get through this message. Don't, don't get up with me. And I said, Pastor Roots, we don't have a Sunday school teacher for tomorrow. Would you please stay and teach tonight that we can have a week? You can't get to Illinois tonight and preach in the morning anyhow. He said, you'll teach tomorrow. I said, no, I'm not either. I don't, I don't read the Bible. I don't teach. The deacon's son was helping me load that truck for the preacher. And I said, David, you teach tomorrow. You're, if your father's been a deacon here, you've been in that church since you were born. You'll teach tomorrow. He said, no, you're going to teach tomorrow. I said, I'm not teaching tomorrow. I pulled the door down on that thing. Sent the preacher off. So went to work. Went to Alcoa. How many of you have been work at Alcoa? Yeah. God bless you. You no, no, it's good. But, but you walk into the pot room where I work, and there was that can they didn't have it clean. There was ore dust on the floor. I mean, just dust. There was trash. There was stuff like this, and papers, and magazines, and everything laying all over the floor. But the wind had sucked them in. And I stepped across that curtain wall and stepped in there, and I started down that pot room. I had a little clear to the other end where I work. And on the way down there, I found a little piece of paper laying on the ground on the floor. I didn't know what it was. I picked it up, put it in my pocket. Went back and got my little smart book. 
I sat down, and when I did, that paper was stuck out of here. I pulled it out, and looked at it, and I read it, turned over. It was pretty interesting. I put it back. The little, little, little more about it. But eight times I had to do that. Eight, one hour, one time an hour to go around with the pot. Eight times I would come back and get my book and I would see that paper. I read it again. Eight times I read that paper. Went home. My wife said, You're going to Sunday school? I said, Leave it away. Went to Sunday school with some of the class, all adults. Remember, folks, I quit high school. The class, the teacher, the, the preacher was teaching was adults. They was a school teacher. They were bankers, business people. And we were sitting there. This was on in our churches today, folks. Everybody was talking. Sunday school was supposed to have been taught. Search your hearts this morning, folks. Hey. Nobody was talking anything about, I heard about vintage cars. I heard a man about fishing. One camping, then the Sunday school teacher or superintendent come in and he had the literature and I said, Henry, we called him Brown. I said, Brown, you're the Sunday school superintendent. We don't have a teacher. You have to teach. That's the laws of the church. He said, you'll teach us. We'll slam whatever. Three times. I said, I am not teaching this class. They started talking about everything they had. I was like God. I started to cry. Here I am. A man that knew everything and quit school. Five years in the Marine Corps. I was tough. I was a killer, man. I began to cry. You know what this big, tough Marine done, Martin? He stood behind his wife. I stood in my chair the best I could to get behind her and this big mouth sister across the table. She looked over and she said, Bob, there's no use to cry about it. Oh, Lord, man. <laughs> <laughs> sister big mouth, man. <laughs> and everybody, everybody stopped and looked down the table at me and the tears were pouring out of my eyes and I'm trying to hide behind my beautiful wife. And I was wanting to get up and leave. Listen, ladies and gentlemen, listen, young people. I wanted to get up and leave, but my legs wouldn't work. They wouldn't work. I finally got the table and I pulled back around. And I composed myself the best I could. And I said, I am ashamed of every one of you people in here. <coughs> every stinking one of you I'm ashamed of. You think that one quiet down the Sunday school room. <laughs> they all looked at me. I said, here it is, 20 minutes into the class. I've heard of baseball, basketball, camping, cars, and everything, but not one time have I heard Jesus' name raised up. Not one time. In a church, in Sunday school. Is this what we came for to hear basketball and baseball? Nope. Amen. I told this man out there, I said, young man, You've been in the church a long time. You're an educated man. I'm going to teach this class if I get in trouble. You better get me out of it. <laughs> I reached over and I got my wife's quarterly. Never seen it before in my life. Never read a quarterly in my life. Didn't know what was in that quarterly. I picked that up. I picked her quarterly up just like this. And I looked at that and I said, mm hmm And I laid it back down. And I started teaching. And I taught. And I taught. And I taught. The bell rung. I just kept teaching. It's going to be about like that today. The second bell rung. I kept teaching. It's going to be about like that today. The third bell rung. And the superintendent came in. He said, Bob, you've got all of the choir in here. Turn them loose. We're waiting for you. I said, it'll be right there. We had a prayer to dismiss the class. Everybody left except my beautiful wife. She said, I'm going to want something. I said, what's that? She said, how did you teach this class? I said, what do you mean? She said, you taught the very lesson. The very lesson. And you never looked at this part. You taught the whole lesson. Never looked. How did you do that? I opened up the shirt and I put another little piece of paper on it. I said, look at this. This is what I found in our pool last night. The whole lesson for that day. I found it in the middle of trash and dust and dirt. 
and I read it, and I read it, and I read it, I had it memorized, and then, when it comes time to teach Sunday school, I knew the lesson. I taught, it. I taught for six solid years and never missed a service. Six years, I read from Genesis to Revelation, back and forth, and I taught every lesson that they had. Now, what do I'm saying about this? I never got to go to seminary. I never went to seminary. But today I stand before you to tell you I'm working on my master's degree in theology. Amen. Now, wait a minute. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. Let me explain that. The master called me and I'm working on you. Amen. Now you do. He said, whatever is in you is going to be known publicly. Whatever you tell somebody in secret, in the closet, whispering in your ear is going to be shouted from the housetop. What are you carrying around in you this morning that God knows about that you're not getting rid of? You don't have to tell everybody in here. But what I do beg you to do is you come to this altar in just a moment. In a few moments, when you come to this altar and say, God, it's me. I need this straight change in my life. I need to get right with you. I haven't been doing what you asked me to do. Lord, I don't even know Christ is my personal Savior. I know if I die right now, I'm not going to hell. You've got to preach yourself, look. Mm -hmm. I'm going to tell you, folks, touch what you're going on, forget it. That's what the Bible says, and not what this preacher says. Right. Whatever's on your heart, whatever's on your mind, now then, I want you to go to Matthew's Gospel. Would you please do that, Matthew 23? I want you to hear what Jesus thinks about these suits and ties and the makeup and sin coverings and all that other stuff that you've got. Matthew 23, first book of the New Testament. Shouldn't be hard for you to find. It says, yes, it was the last time you looked at it. And then, Matthew 23, verse 23, listen to what Jesus is saying. He said, Woe well, unto you, scribe Pharisees, hypocrites. Now, I, I'm reading, I'm going to put another word in there. Now, I generally don't do this, but I want you to hear how, just about how Jesus would do that. He, he said, Woe well, unto you, scribes and Pharisees, you hypocrites. Now, if that word you is in your Bible, you don't have a King James verse. But he just said hypocrites, for you pay tithes of mint and anus and, and cumin, and have omitted the weightier matters of the law, judgment, mercy, faith. These ought you have done, and not left the other undone. You blind guides, which strain at a gnat and swallow a cow. Go unto you, scribe Pharisees, hypocrites. You may clean the outside of the cup and the platter, but within they are full of extortion and excess. Thou blind Pharisees, cleanse first the which is, it, is within the cup and the platter, and the outside of them may be clean also. You let God clean you up. That's right. He cleaned you up on the inside. You want the outside cleaned up. That's right. And I'm a, I'm a living example of that. Once God changed me on the inside, I didn't want to look ugly anymore. I couldn't change my face much. You have to live with it. But no, seriously, folks, I changed my attitude. Once I got changed on the inside, I've seen that there's a lot of other people that had a worse life than I did. And I'll tell you what God done when He called me to the third church that I pastored. I pastored Friendship Baptist Church for 22 years. And you know why? You know why? God put me there. I couldn't for a long time. Why did you put me down here in the, in the Fulton Projects where there's children running the streets in all hours and I have little children? There's prostitution, there's drugs, there's killings. Black fella come to me about a month after I was there and he said, you the preacher here? And I said, yes, I am. He said, I want to help you. And I said, Pray, I praise the Lord, I use help. He said, son, he said, don't go back in these projects at night by yourself, particularly don't wear a suit and tie or dress up. He said, if you go back, if you have to go back there and even you get a hold of me, he said, as long as I'm with you, they won't bother you. But he said, you go back there by yourself, you may not come back out. And I think, God, why did you send me here to this place? What, I, I, in fact, I told friends here, no, I'm not coming here. Well, it was a prayer made right in the parking lot. 24 hours later, I surrendered to go down there. I said, why did you send me? Why, God, why did you send me here? For years, I guess for five or six years, I asked the question, God, why am I here in this place? Well, about two blocks from there, I was, I was raised up about two years there during the Second World War. We had 12, 12 in a one-room house, no bathroom, just one little stick of running water. 
One string like concrete floors and everybody piled on top of each other when we went to bed. Rats from the, from the first avenue dump would come across the creek and enter our bed at night. And many times I'd wake up and there'd be a wet rat sitting on my chest. I'm not, I'm not making it up for them. They ate what little food we had. They tried to get it off our fingers. We'd been bitten by the rats. And he said, God said, do you want to remember? Do you, you think you're better than these people? Do you think you're better? You've experienced it. I put you here to let these folks know that they can be lifted up. They can be cleaned up. Go speak to them. I'm putting you back where you've had experience. And he put me right back where I started from as a little boy. You know how many times I got left in school? I was two years behind that time. My wife put up me first year. I was so little, nobody made me go to school, so I didn't go to school. My parents didn't take care of us. They went off and left us when we were children. Left us in the house. The welfare got us. Make sure we hadn't eaten for a long time. Folks, I hadn't taken a bath. That one year, I hadn't had a bath in my life. And that one year, that whole year, I didn't have a bath. Until a black lady found me and my two little brothers and sisters. And she called us up on a little ridge and she put some water out in the tub. And she brought us up there because she felt so sorry for us. She took our clothes completely off of us. She had a little bitty shack up there. Her husband had passed. And she took all of those little children, my baby sister, little baby brother, myself, and a brother two years older than me. And she socked us down and into each other and she started scrubbing. Now that lot was, they used to dump the flies there from the war of the factories. And it was just coal dust, just dust. And that's what we played in. All every day went to bed like that. And this black lady, bless her heart. She took us up there and she stood in the church And all at once I heard her under her voice say, Oh, Lordy, 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 I'm sorry, I stood up too long, too long, they turned white. <laughs> <laughs> she cleaned us up. She washed us up. We went butt naked, took us in her house, sat at the table and fed us and took our clothes and washed them and hung them out in the sun and dried them. And then when the clothes was all dry, she fed us, she put them clothes back on us. She, all the little jail. She said, y'all get on down home now. You don't walk up in here. Y'all get on home now. She's done that a couple of times. You tell me I'm supposed to be crazy to get back. Amen. Amen. Not me. That's right. Amen. Not me. Amen. I'm not crazy against anybody. There's only one that I'm crazy against. That's Satan. Yeah. Yeah. He's destroying us. Yeah. He's destroying our family. This church, I can see it. It's got a blessing in here. God's moving in the church. And you bring your babies. And you, when that baby is born, young people, when that baby is born, I'll tell you where you ought to take what you grab. You ought to bring it to the altar and dedicate it back to God. And raise that baby in church. And raise that baby in Sunday school. Let them know that there's a better way of life. Because everything you do, God sees. Woe unto you, scribes, you Pharisees, you hypocrites. For you are like the white and sepulchre, which indeed appear beautiful outward, but are full of, or within full of dead men bones. Even so, you also appear, outwardly appear righteous unto men, but within you are full of hypocrisy. Listen, and iniquity inside you. Many today in our churches are sitting all dressed up and looking good, and there's something wrong on the inside. What are you going to do about it? God sees it. There's something you can do, ladies and gentlemen, that's come to the form of grace. Over there in the Gospel of John, what does God say He's going to do? What's the answer? I'm really glad folks asked that because this is the answer that comes out of God's Word. In John 3, 5, it says, I say to you, except, or unto thee, except a man be born of water in the Spirit, he cannot enter to the kingdom of God. He's saying you've got to be completely cleaned up inside of this third bath business is not going to get it. That putting on those fine looking clothes and coming to Sunday school on Easter Sunday and Christmas Day, that's not going to get it. You know what I'm talking about? You see it eat Christmas, don't you? Yeah. Christmas and Easter, that's what and they think God owes them something there because they've been here two Sundays out of the year. That's not going to get it, folks. God knows what's inside your heart. He knows what you're saying and he knows what you think. Amen. Jeremiah chapter 31. I want you to hear what he says he's going to do if you'll give him a chance. 
He said, For I will forgive their iniquity and I will remember their sins no more. And then in also in Psalms, chapter, uh, Psalm 3, 100, Psalm 103 and verse 12. I want you to hear this because a lot of people think, Man, I've been saved and I got dirty and I'm going to be. Mm -mm, mm -mm. As far as east is from west, so far hath he removed our transgressions from us. Then in Hebrews, chapter 8, verse 12. He said, for I will, I will be merciful to their unrighteousness and their sins and their iniquities. I will remember no more. All you got your neighbor, you got somebody in your family that's going to remember everything that you've ever done. And they're going to bring it up. They're going to tell it. But God says, I will forgive it. I will put it for us. from what they never, never, never remember it again. Ladies and gentlemen, I don't know how you, what, how you stand on this. But I say, once say, God will say. Amen. Because the Bible says that you're sealed until the day of redemption. I don't know how many of you, you, you precious ladies here uh, have ever canned in your life. Now, I come from a, a, a farm that we can everything. We can grass to get it cut. We, we were poor. You know, we still poor with one over. But we would not have anything that she could get in a jar. But here's what she got in the old days. She would put that stuff down in there. And she would put that lid on there tight. Then we had a big cauldron of wax. Hot wax. She would take that jar and turn it upside down in there. Just above the lid. And then she would pull that up. Let that wax seal that off. No air could get into it. You could take that jar. You could boil it in the mud. You could throw it. The jar won't get dirty. But what's inside is still kept. Because it's sealed. That's where your soul is. You can get out here and you can get all messed up and get dirty, but on the inside you're still clean. You remember the prodigal son. Because he walked away from his daddy, it didn't mean that wouldn't be daddy anymore. His right. daddy was waiting for him to come back, just like he's waiting for right. you if you've got long in your life. Just want to come to him grace and let him clean you up now. Amen. Mm. I want to show you something. And I'll finish this up in just a moment. I hope I don't make a big mess up here. But I want to get to I'm getting a little hungry and I thought I'd take a bite. Let me try to get some bite. Let me try to get Oh, here's what I'm looking for. Yeah, buddy. Y'all sit down in the back. 
No one sees it does. In other words, ladies and gentlemen, God sees what's in the inside of you. And you can clean yourself all you want to. And until you let God do the work, you're going to be just as nasty on the inside as He was all your life. Amen. I want to show you that, to impress on you what God says that He's going to do for you today. What is the answer? First of all, ladies and gentlemen, Isaiah 1.18 says this. This is what God is calling you for. Your invitation to come to His altar and get home. God says, <clears throat> excuse me, calm down. Let us meet together, saith the Lord, for your sins be as scarlet. They shall be white as snow. Those that be red like crimson, they shall be as wool. The apples. That dirty apple. When he come to, to Christ and got cleaned up, all clean on the inside. But that one that cleaned himself up is still dirty on the inside. Now, I want you to hear something in the close of it before we close this out. What does God promise us if we come to the altar? What does he promise the, the world? What does he promise in the United States? Folks, in the trouble that we've got in this United States today, we need God to do whatever we have before. Amen. Amen. Now, you can call on Washington, D.C. all you want. You can call on Mr. Trump, whoever it is that's running this place, or running the government. And you're going to get the same old story. But we're working on We're going to make it great again. They're not going to do anything about the power of God. And I'm telling you this morning, folks, of all the problems that's in this church, and there's problems in this church, don't tell me you're not. Well, there's two or three gathered together, the Lord's there. Why is he there? Because there are problems there. And he's come to straighten them out. And folks, there are problems. You have needs. It don't mean because you come to this altar that you've done some outlandish sin. God has said, I love you. I want to help you with every problem you've got. And I will lift you up and I'll cause you to prosper. So what is he saying? You remember Jesus, the Lord said, Come unto me, let us reason together. Though your sins may just call it to be white as snow. He said, Come to me. If you will do that, listen to what God said. He said, If my people, which are you, if my people which are called by my name shall humble themselves, and that's what you need to do is humble yourself and come out of the chair and down the aisle and meet with the Lord Jesus Christ and tell God what it is that's on your heart and on your mind and let Him know what you need. He said, if you'll just humble yourself. But we don't want to humble ourselves. I'm afraid what someone's going to say. I don't know. They might think I've done something real bad. Let them think what they want in between you and God. If they'll humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven and will forgive their sins and heal their land. Amen. I don't know what you're waiting on, folks. When you've got all of these problems in your heart and your life, when you've got all of these things that bother you, and some of you may have children here that's just rebellious, God can straighten them out. He has taken this young man, as I said, being a young man, and then, Lord, I'm young, and in Christianity, I'm a baby. He had taken me from the ghettos that I created myself and made a preacher of Amen. And I thank God for that. If He can do that for me, in the condition that I was in, in the life that I was living, you don't have to question what God can do for you because He'll take care of it. But there's always somebody going to talk. Always somebody want to tell something bad. Reminds me, and I'm, I will close with this with that invitation. Reminds me that I need to pick this chunk of dirt. Uh, so, that gets me. Reminds me of a story I heard one time real quickly. There was a gentleman by the name of Joe. That he, he come to church. He said, to you, and, uh, he was just a fine gentleman. I was there every Sunday. But Sister Know It All and Sister Tell It All happened to see Joe's car one time in the evening pulled up in front of a tavern. Hmm. Guess what she done? She kept an eye on that for a long time and got up the next morning. 
I call it school. I call it school. Come church time. Of course, he kind of helped out the church. And when she went to the church, he said, well, I don't think Lord let Joe have any part of this anymore because I've seen his car parked in front of that tavern and you can only imagine what was going on in there. Mm -hmm. Quick to tell him. Joe didn't say anything. He just said, well, we're just going to sit there and get lunch. He just kind of dropped his head. Kind of dropped his head. He didn't say anything. When Joe went home that night, he got in his car. And he drove up in front of Miss Susie Big Mouth's house and parked the car right in front of the house and left it there all night. <laughs> we got a lot of, got a lot of joy. We got a lot of joy. So always remember somebody's ready to say something, but when you pray to God, God said, Not only will I forgive you, I will move your sins as far as east is from west and never remember them again. And then he said, Whatever you need, come and talk to me about it. I don't know. What your problem is today, but you do. Who's in, who's in charge here when your pastor's going? I need a deacon or somebody to who, who introduced me up here this morning. Oh, yeah? Who introduced me? Come on up here, young man. Somebody needs to stand up here. I'm not the pastor of this church, but I want to tell you, I'd be glad to, to come back, and I'm hoping to come back tonight if you let me. I'm just going to have this man here to stand here. He's a, you're a member of the church, aren't you? <laughs> Thank you, Joe. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, let's get serious. This is the most serious part of the service. This is when you get to come and you get to speak to God. Don't, don't wait for somebody else to go. If you want to go and you're a little bit nervous, take somebody to the hand and come on down here. God has said that my children will come to me. If you think this world is in trouble, if you think this world is in going to hell in a handbag, if you please, Get up here and pray for the United States of America and pray for our children and pray for our service people who are trying to keep it free. And you might have something in your heart that God is wanting to talk to you about if you'll just turn it over to Him. I'm going to ask you to buy your kids. Would you please stand? That way you have a chance to just come out of the chairs and down in the pews. This man here will be there to answer the questions he possibly can. Would you buy your kids? Heavenly Father God, thank you for this time that you've allowed us to be in this precious group of people. Lord, I know that there's problems here. I know there's people with some aching parts. I know there's people that may be concerned about their husband or their wife or their children. I know there's people here that may have a sickness that's taken their life or trying to take their life. There may be those here, Father, that have never really come to grips with their own life and said, God, I know I'm a sinner. Would you please save my soul for Jesus' sake? If there's one here like that today, God that doesn't really make, has never really made that profession of faith. I pray the Holy Spirit would just move on their hearts and move them down that aisle and give them joy when they receive Christ as their personal Savior. Father, there's many reasons why they can come. I pray, Father, that they will feel free to step out of the aisle, come and step out of their pews and chairs and come down that aisle and bring somebody with them if they have to and just kneel before a holy God and humble themselves and give a blessing that we're going to give in Jesus. Amen. Folks, would you look up here?